The purpose of this video is to review how the immune response to vaccines occurs. Now, the immunology concepts that will be covered in this video including, will include how the immune system protects, detects and recognizes, and remembers these vaccine responses. Now, at the end of this video, you should be able to explain how the immune system generates a protective antibody response to T-cell dependent or protein antigens. Second, explain how the immune system generates a productive antibody response to T-cell independent or carbohydrate antigens. And lastly, explain how conjugate vaccines change T-cell independent to T-cell dependent immune responses. Now, let's review how the immune system responds to a T-cell dependent or protein antigen. And this is the way that it responds to most proteins. Uh, it will make, this will remind you of things that you have earned, learned earlier. So first of all, uh, the vaccine containing a protein is administered. And this may be administered into the muscle or into the skin. And phagocytes migrate to the site of, uh, of that injection and they begin to ingest the vaccine proteins. They digest those vaccine proteins and they present pieces of what they have digested uh, on the cell surface in MHC class II molecules. Now these phagocytes, may, some of them may stay at the site uh, of the injection, but many of these phagocytes will migrate back to local draining lymph nodes where they uh, begin to interact with other immune cells to show them what they have ingested uh, out in the tissues. And among the cells that they interact with are T cells. And of course, this begins as they take back these antigens to the lymph node. Uh, it begins a germinal center reaction. And um, in this case, the antigen presenting cell uh, presents in MHC class two the uh, pieces of the uh, antigens that it has taken up and digested. It shows those to CD4 positive helper T cells that recognize those in uh, peptides in the context of the MHC class two molecule. And this activates the T cells. Uh, in, uh, the activation occurs because of stimulation through the T cell receptor and co-receptor molecules, uh, these co-stimulatory molecules, including the B7 molecules on the antigen presenting cell and CD28 on the T cell, act together to activate the T cell. And when it becomes activated, it upregulates expression of a molecule on its cell surface called CD40 ligand. Now, on the other side, remember that B cells also ingest antigen, but they do this in a very specific way. The antigen proteins bind to the B cell receptor, which is the antibody molecule on the surface of the B cell. Those B cells take in that uh, antigen and the, uh, the antigen receptor, and they digest it and present fragments of what they have digested in the MHC class II molecules. Now remember that when B cells uh, see the antigen that they're supposed to bind to, they get very activated. They want to be involved in the immune response and they begin to make a large amount of IgM. But they can't switch over to make IgG and IgA without the help of a T cell. So they then, uh, in the germinal center, come into contact with uh, T cells that have been primed or activated by their interaction with antigen presenting cells. These T cells see the same antigen that they've seen on the antigen presenting cell. They now see that antigen being presented to them in the context of the MHC class II molecule on the B cell, and they recognize that this B cell uh, is taking place in, in response to the same antigen, and those, those T cells then provide help so that that B cell can switch or class switch the, their antibodies so that they can switch from making IgM to making IgG, IgA, or IgE. Now, remember that the way that this is done is that the T cells, when they get activated, they express on their cell surface uh, CD40 ligand. And CD40 ligand interacts with CD40 on the surface of the B cell and provides like a secret handshake uh, for the T cell to basically tell that B cell, you're okay, you're doing what you're supposed to, you're responding to a foreign antigen, and I'm going to help you switch from making IgM to making IgG and IgA, etc. In addition, the T cell provides extra help to that B cell by secreting uh, cytokines such as interleukin-4 and interleukin-5 that stimulate the B cells to undergo immunoglobulin class switching and to grow and divide so that that B cell now can uh, clonally expand in order to make a large amount of antibody to the pathogen that it has seen. Now, this takes a little bit of time to create this germinal center reaction, and you may remember that the initial response to a pathogen or to an injected vaccine 
occur, occurs initially by the production of IgM that begins within a day or two after the uh, antigen is injected. However, the class switching to make I, lots of IgG and IgA does not uh, really uh, get into full swing until seven to 10 days after the, the antigen is encountered. And so it takes uh, at least that long before you can measure substantial amounts of circulating IgG or IgA in most individuals. Now, um, if you give a booster vaccine, then you get a secondary response where you get a large amplification of the of IgG production because of expansion of memory B cells that have already been trained up to bind to this specific antigen and that occurs very quickly and, and the, those cells all make uh, IgG or IgA uh, because they've already been trained before with the primary response uh, to respond appropriately to this antigen. The way in which the immune system responds to carbohydrate antigens is different than the way that it responds to T-cell dependent protein antigens. In the case of carbohydrates, the carbohydrate antigens uh, are in, that have been injected in the case of a vaccine circulate around the body in blood and lymph, and in doing so come into contact with the marginal zone in lymph nodes and spleens. In the marginal zone, there are a couple of cell types that are very important. One of these are phagocytic cells that have specialized scavenger receptors on them, able to bind to the carbohydrate antigens so that they can be ingested. And the second are specialized B cells known as marginal zone B cells. These B cells have some innate type properties in that they can respond to carbohydrate antigens without requiring T cell help. The carbohydrate antigens, because of their repetitive structure, they have repeated epitopes that are able to bind to the antibody molecules or B cell receptors on the surface of the B cells and cross-link these receptors. In doing that, they activate the B cells and these marginal zone B cells begin to grow and divide. And um, these, uh, over the course of uh, about a week or so, these marginal zone B cells will begin to develop into plasma cells, some of which undergo immunoglobulin class switching from IgM to IgG and IgA. And these plasma cells in, don't require T cell help to undergo class switching. Uh, these plasma cells then migrate to the red pulp in the spleen where they live and continue to make antibody for some time. Uh, many times these plasma cells may survive for several months uh, after which they undergo apoptosis or programmed cell death and the antibody responses to the carbohydrate antigens then wane and ultimately uh, go away. Because the plasma cells generated in this manner don't require T cell help, they don't go through the, a normal germinal center reaction, they don't develop bona fide B cell memory, and as a result, these responses to the carbohydrates don't tend to persist for long periods of time. Now, the problem with these carbohydrate vaccines is that some individuals, particularly infants uh, under the age of two, uh, and some adults are not able to respond well to carbohydrate antigens. Uh, and as a result, vaccines that contain only carbohydrates are ineffective in these individuals. To, in order to try and help uh, make it possible for these uh, individuals to make antibody responses to carbohydrates, uh, the carbohydrate can be conjugated to a protein, uh, generating a conjugate vaccine, as has been discussed in previous videos. These conjugate vaccines contain carbohydrate that is covalently linked to particular proteins. Uh, most commonly, these are diphtheria toxoid proteins, and these serve as a carrier for the carbohydrates. In doing this, it shifts the response from a T-cell independent response, which would be required for responding to the carbohydrates, to a T-cell dependent protein-like response, so that even small children who don't have the ability to respond to carbohydrates yet are now able to respond to these conjugate vaccines. And so it shifts the response, again, from a T-cell independent to a T-cell dependent pathway. And what it provides is for a more robust and a more persistent uh, B-cell response to carbohydrates, in addition to generating better B-cell memory, memory responses to these types of antigens. So, the key takeaway points from this video are first, that protein antigens uh, are T cell dependent and responses to these protein antigens take place in the germinal center. In contrast, 
uh, responses to carbohydrate antigens are T cell independent and require the function of specialized marginal zone B cells. And these responses take part largely outside of the germinal center in extra follicular areas of the body. Lastly, uh, T cell independent uh, antigens such as pure carbohydrates can be converted to T cell dependent antigens by conjugating them to proteins so that they are shifted into a T cell dependent germinal center type of response allowing for a more robust and more persistent immune response to take place.